Okay, this question has to do with the shape and the length of polymers. The question says, consider nylon 66 polymer, and it has a degree of polymerization of n equals 1300. Now, part A says, estimate the length of this polymer chain from end to end, if it was a straight line. Part B says, if the polymer tends to ball up with a radius of r equals d times square root of capital N, where d is the bond distance, and n is the total number of bonds in the chain, what would be the radius of the balled up polymer? So let's start with part A. To do part A, we need to answer a couple questions first. First off, we need to know what is the type of bonds along this chain, and then how long are those, and what are the angles associated with those? Because the overall length of this mer unit, say right there, let's call that L, small l, that's gonna be equal to the number of bonds times the distance of that bond, multiplied by the sine of the angle between those bonds, let's call it theta, over two. Where does that come from? Well, imagine right here, carbon bonded to carbon bonded to carbon, right? This angle is 109.5. The reason it's 109.5 is because each one of these carbon also has two hydrogens sticking off the side of it, and therefore it's a tetrahedra, right? As a tetrahedra, um, we know that it's going to be 109.5 because that's the best way that you can put four objects all the way around a sphere. Now we need to figure out the distance from, let's draw a dashed line down right here, what is this distance right there, x? Well, from trigonometry, we know that this is the hypotenuse up here, which we're gonna call d. d is our hypotenuse. We know the angle theta is 109.5, and half of that angle would be right here, this angle right there, that's gonna be theta over two. So if we wanna figure out x, that's gonna be equal to d times sine of theta over two, right? That will give us x. So to do this problem, we're gonna to need to know what are the bond distances for carbon and carbon, but we also have things right here. That's a carbon bonded to a nitrogen. Draw that better. Carbon bonded to a nitrogen. And we've got different angles because in some cases it's gonna be 109.5 because that's what the orbital hybridization produces is a tetrahedral arrangement. But in some cases, like right there, that's not going to be. That instead is gonna look like this. You're gonna have carbon bonded to carbon, bonded to carbon, but this is now double bonded to an oxygen. So it's no longer tetrahedral, it's going to be trigonal planar. So you can imagine what it might be in order the best way to space out three bonds is to have 120 degrees angle between them, right? And now we need to just, last thing we need to do is figure out that a carbon-carbon bond is going to have a distance of 1.54 angstroms if it's a single bond. And a carbon-nitrogen bond is pretty close, actually. It's 1.479 um, angstroms, so pretty close, but slightly less. So now the last thing we need to do is we just need to count up the different types of bonds here. We can do so pretty easily. We've got carbon-carbon bonds in a tetrahedral arrangement, right? And in a 120 degrees arrangement. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. There are 10 total. There are 10 of these, of which eight are in 109.5 degree arrangements, and two of them are in 120 degree arrangements. Now of our carbon nitrogen bonds, if you count them up, there are four, one, two, three, four, right? And you have two of each, two and two. Two with 109.5 degrees and two with 120 degrees. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna plug in this formula right here. We're gonna plug in four versions of that for the four different types of bonds and bond angles that we have. So let's go ahead and do so. We have eight times 1.54 multiplied by the sine of 109.5 divided by two plus two with the same exact thing, except for it's going to be 120 degrees divided by two, plus, let's give ourselves a little more room, we're going to have two times 1.479 times the sine of 109.5 divided by two, plus the same thing, but with 120 degrees. So when I plug all that in, I find that the distance of each mer unit, if it was stretched out in a line, you know, not bending the bonds, but you know, in a straight line, then we would get that to be equal to 17 
0.706 angstroms, right? Now, if we did a quick just sanity check, what if we were to just estimate this thing off of carbon-carbon bonds? We know that carbon-carbon is not that far off from carbon-nitrogen, that 109 versus 120 really aren't big differences. So what would we have if we did just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 bonds? What if we just did 14 carbon-carbon bonds? In fact, it comes out to be pretty close. It would be 17.6, 17.6, which is... Um, pretty close to the value that we got. So pretty good idea that we've got there on the bond length of our, each of our Murray unit. So what about the total length of the entire polymer? Well, the total length, let's call that capital N, that's going to be equal to small n, each Murray length multiplied by the total number of those, which is, thir which is 1300. Plug that all in and you get a value of 23,017 angstroms. Now remember that an angstrom is the same thing as um, times 10 to the negative 10 meters, right? And then you can move this over one, two, three, four spots in the decimal. So this is really equal to 2.3017 times 10 to the negative 6 meters, which is just the same as 2.3 micrometers, right? 2.3017 technically, right? So this thing is not very long. Even though it's a pretty long polymer, 1300 for its degree polymerization, uh, still you couldn't see it with your naked eye. Right, that's still really uh, not that long of a polymer. It's only a couple microns long. Now let's move to part B. Part B says, okay, things in the polymer world are oftentimes not lined up. Sometimes bonding and other reasons make them line up, but in many cases they actually uh, wind up into a ball. And this is kind of the reason why. If you have degrees of freedom in your bonds, rather than going in a straight line, what they might do is they might do lines like this. Each one of those bends might have the characteristic 109.5 degrees or whatever it's supposed to be, but it doesn't have to go in a straight line. So instead you end up with some sort of molecule that has an overall radius that's made up of these things. In this question, we're told that the radius could be calculated by d times square root of n, right? So in this, we need to remember that d is not the same. It's not carbon-carbon bonds all the way. In some instances it's carbon, and in other instances it's others. So let's add these up uh, components from both. So how many of the different types do we have? Well, let's do carbon first. Our total radius is going to be equal to 1.54. That's the carbon-carbon bond distance. Then that's going to be multiplied by the total number of bonds that are carbon. We know that there was 10 carbon-carbon bonds per unit, 1,300 total. So that's going to be 10 times 1,300. Then we're going to add to that the carbon-nitrogen bonds, 1.479 angstroms multiplied by, this time there's four of those per mer unit, four times 1300. When I plug those in, let's see, I get a total value of 28.22 nanometers, or in other words, 282 angstroms. So that would be the size of this particle if that was the function that described its radius.